I just want to thank you all for being here today. It's a wonderful evening. We're glad that we can get together. Uh, important topic, important information. And uh, I think you're going to get something out of it today. But I do fear that the people that need it the most are the ones that are missing. Uh, it's kind of one of those things where uh, sometimes the thing that you need the most, um, you're so deep down in the thick of it, uh, you're in such crisis that uh, it's hard to even look for solutions. And so uh, right now, as we're getting together to talk about the family, there are families all over the city, all over this fair land of ours that are in crisis. There are families where there's a tug of war going on. There's a battle royale between husbands and wives. And uh, this is perhaps the antidote, the thing that they need to hear is God's design for the family, and yet um, they're um, embroiled in their own crisis. So we're going to just hope and pray that this will be an encouragement, and maybe we can continue to pass along these wonderful eternal truths to people as we come in contact with people that struggle in their relationships. Uh, we're going to get back into our series called Family Matters. That's the name of the series. It sort of has a double meaning, doesn't it? We're going to talk about matters pertaining to the family, and that's because families really do matter. And uh, they matter to God, and they matter in the world, <laughs> it's like we just talked about, in a world that has tirelessly worked to devalue God's concept of the family, the world has tried to come up with their own version of what a family should look like, all sorts of shapes and sizes, and they still haven't come close to creating a model that compares to the one that God designed at the very beginning for you and I. He really knew what he was doing, and while there are no perfect families, I will admit that, it still is the best plan ever devised uh, for relationships. And I would go one step further. I believe that Traditional families are the bedrock that holds our society together. It's not the government. It's not found in our education system or in our affluence as a nation. Huh, that could be the downfall of our country. No, the, the health of a nation is rooted in the home. And today our culture is suffering because of literally the disintegration of the family uh, the family the way that God designed it to be. So let me ask uh, just an oversimplification, maybe a question that we all need to start with is why did God create the family? We just touched on this briefly last week, but did he have some divine purpose that he was trying to achieve by creating this institution called the family? And the answer is, of course, yes. His first purpose, not his only purpose, but his first purpose in giving us the family was to create a suitable environment, a device to propagate the human race. Uh, last week we uh, began exploring this family and he, we talked about how he had this plan to have one man and one woman join together in an exclusive permanent relationship and these two individuals would come together as one and form the foundation of a family. And the first responsibility that God gave them as a couple was to create more humans. Uh, as we said last week, God commanded Adam and Eve, he says what? Be fruitful and multiply and do what? And fill the earth. I mean, uh, that was a daunting task. I'm sure he didn't expect Adam and Eve to do it alone, but this was a greater command given to the, to the world that this was God's desire, is that this world would be heavily populated with more of the, God's wonderful creation. Ever since the beginning, God intended for married couples to procreate. Having children is a natural result of a man and a woman bonding together, in this one flesh relationship. Simple biology we're talking about, right? So what we have is, uh, in, in a family, is a husband and a wife who have children. They become mother and father, and this group of people compose the family. This is God's ideal. There are other types of family structures, some of them unintended, some of them um, 
uh, misfortunate situations that result in less than ideal components together. But these components, when these components exist, they are, form the possibility to create the perfect ingredients to fill the earth. And this institution has other purposes as well. God didn't just want us to populate the earth. He wanted us to pass it along. God intended that this family unit would raise up godly children who would one day leave and raise up more godly children. Look what it says in Deuteronomy 4.9. It says, only give heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently so that you do not forget the things which your eyes have seen and they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life. And then he says right at the end there, but make them known to your sons and your grandsons. Passing it down from one generation to the other, right? That's really what God desired for all of mankind, is that they would be able to continue to pass on this heritage of their faith. So here's the process. The mother, the father raised this child or children. You might have more than one, right? And uh, obviously, um, when we talk about raising children, we're talking about more than just caring for their physical needs. Uh, we're talking about nurturing them. We're talking about uh, develop, helping them to develop emotionally, intellectually, uh, and most of all, spiritually. And that's where it comes in, this whole dimension of passing on the faith. And at some point, what happens? Your children grow up. And by the time they get to a certain age, you would believe and you would hope that you've done a good enough job that that child leaves the home. You might ask, well, when does this occur? Well, it's getting later and later. People are staying around with their parents a little longer. Uh, that's a loaded question. But the reason the Bible says that a man leaves his mother and father is because he is going to cleave to his wife. So the purpose of leaving is to start a new independent family of his own and with someone else. My opinion, though, is that uh, children should take advantage of this arrangement to stay at home as long as they can. Live at home until they're ready to move out, until you're ready to start a family. This is a time when, when that little period where you can prepare for what is going to be a major transition because now all the responsibility is going to fall on you and you can prepare yourself to create a source of income. You can become mature enough spiritually uh, to, and emotionally, that's even sometimes as important in a marriage, uh, to, and to a lesser degree, prepare yourself financially to handle the responsibility of marriage and child rearing because that's what's ultimately going to come out of it in most cases. Because you're not being um, shackled with all of the many bills. Mom and dad are covering that. You could even start to save. It's a great time to save, right? So as long as mom and dad will let you stay around, I would stay in the house, all right? <laughs> Just a little, a little helpful advice there. Now, obviously, some people, they grow up, they haven't found that person yet, and, and yet they're pretty independent. They're ready to move out, become independent uh, before they even find that mate, and that's fine. But the goal when they leave the nest is to find a partner and to get married. Uh, and so the cycle repeats, right? Obviously, these days it seems like it's much easier said than done. It's becoming more and more difficult from my conversations with young singles for men and women to find someone that they feel that they can spend the rest of their life with. I don't know if it's sometimes we're too picky. You know, we have such a high standard that's an impossible standard to meet. Or, or maybe it's really because uh, they really want something that's dynamic. And um, that might be the case. But I'll tell you, speaking from experience, I, I can tell you that marriage is a wonderful gift. I'm sure that there are many people who have a hard time accepting this statement after having seen relationships around them that have crashed and burned. Uh, they're, 
perhaps very cynical about the biblical concept of marriage. Why would I want to get married? Perhaps they came from a broken home. They said, the last thing I want to do is get hitched. That's, that's for, no, no, I don't, want to, I don't want anything to do with that. They associate all of the heartache with this concept of marriage. It's not that marriage is broke. It's that those who were involved in it did not apply God's principles in their marriage. But when you do find someone, let's go back to this. When you find someone who truly wants to be your teammate, who's fully invested in this new independent entity called a family, it's really a glorious thing. Marriage is a a, a unique relationship, uh, unlike any other human relationship that you'll ever experience with anybody else. The things that a husband and wife share are reserved for that one person in the whole world that you can share that with. And that makes it very special, doesn't it? Now, unfortunately, many people are sharing these things with all sorts of people indiscriminately. Things that they uh, should have been reserved and kept and shared exclusively for only with the one person that they were going to marry. We're going to talk about this. Uh, down the road, but when you give away to others what was only meant for your future husband or wife, what you're doing, and it's something people don't realize, is they're, they're actually short-circuiting the bonding mechanism that God has put in all of us. I can't explain it, but there's some kind of physiological thing that happens when two people come together physically. He designed um, this form, a, a, sort of like a super glue, this super strong attachment with the person that you become sexually intimate with. So be careful who you're physically intimate with because you're forming a, a, a bond with that person. And every time that you have sex with someone other than your future wife, with someone new other than your future husband, you weaken the strength of that bond. And it's really something that God can redeem, but it's something that uh, was never intended. Now, I know there are exceptions to this paradigm that I just described that God has created. Some people might, might be out here right now, some people listening. You might have the gift of singleness. I think that that is a real thing. Paul said, I would rather that, you know, you all stay single. But he was a realist he realized that that's not, it's very uncommon actually. And only a few people have the gift of being single. Most of us were not wired to do a solo act. Uh, But uh, unfortunately, sometimes things happen and even if you want to be married, it doesn't always occur. But this picture, that is a very simple picture, it's a family in a nutshell. But I want us to kind of dissect it because I, I think it's, it's one thing to put a man and a woman together who have children. It's another thing to make it work. So I want to dissect each part of the family, each component in a family, every person in a family is critical. And I guess it all starts at the top. So that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm sure what I'm about to say would be a hotly debated topic on college campuses, but here's the reality. The reality is male leadership is God's design for the home. Male leadership, it all starts at the top. It could be argued, and I think quite persuasively, that men are the glue that holds it all together. Now, some people said, you know, you hear those cute little sayings, happy wife, happy life. If mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. You know, I've heard all those. And there's a lot of truth to those things. But I'll tell you, there's this certain type of stability that comes from a man. It says in Ephesians 5, 22 and through 24. Let me read that passage to you. Uh, it's, these are some cornerstone passages uh, about marriage, about husbands and wives. And uh, this one, uh, a lot of people don't want to read it. But let me read it for you. It says, wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. 
By the way, it doesn't say subject to any man. It says be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. Verse 24 says, But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Now this passage that we're reading here is the beginning of laying out God's design for order and for structure. You can write that down on your notes if you have them in front of you. God has given certain order and structure. You know, every kind of organization has to have order. It has to have structure. You could have chaos if nobody knows who's in charge, if nobody knows what each person's responsibility is, right? And so God in the family has laid out some order and some structure. In a family, it's clear from this passage that God has designated men as the head of the home. Now, you notice I didn't say men are the head of the home. <laughs> I didn't say it like that. <laughs> okay? I, I think, again, this, this whole concept bristles people. The term we often use to describe this position that a man ha has in a home, we use the term headship, biblical headship. It should surprise no one. That this view of headship, it's an extremely unpopular view in modern circles, where especially where women's rights are being championed so viciously. Uh, but nonetheless, this is the model that God has designed for families. This is not antiquated. This is a passage that God has given uh, to the church in Ephesus, and it's a passage that applies to us. Perhaps the best way to explain this concept of biblical headship and this whole thing is to start by explaining what headship is not, okay? Headship, uh, in God's value system, when God looks at humanity, he views men and women as completely equal in value and importance. It's not like the men are more important than the women, okay? Um, in God's eyes, neither person is superior to the other, this is not talking about superiority or inferiority. Uh, that means that each person in a marriage has something valuable to contribute to the family. And perhaps the biggest misconception is the idea of what biblical submission means. We're talking about headship, and then we talk about the flip side, which is submission. It says wives are to be subject to the husband. When we hear that word, there are all sorts of things that conjure up in our brain. But the definition of submission is, and here it is, it's a simple definition, generally speaking. Submission is voluntarily placing yourself under the authority of another. Now, I suppose if you were a slave in, uh, you know, the early years of Americana, you were placed under the authority of another against your will. But when we're talking about this, in marriage, marriage is what we're referring to. In marriage, it is voluntarily, willingly deferring to the leadership and authority of your husband. It's not something that is being forced upon you. It's something that you are willingly choosing to do. Man serves in the family as the head of the woman, and the woman chooses to place herself under the authority of the man. Submission doesn't mean that you have to agree on everything, and that the husband, what the husband says goes, and, and you just be quiet, and you don't have nothing to say about anything. That's not the concept of submission. It's taking submission just a little bit too far. Everyone because we're all equally important and valuable, everyone has an opinion. Submission doesn't mean that a husband makes all the decisions without consulting you. I don't think that would be too wise, guys. In fact, you should come together when you have important decisions to discuss and, uh, and these issues. And uh, you both, guess what? This is, <laughs> might be a very novel thought to you men, uh, but you both have brains. 
That's right. It's true. And you were meant to complement and sharpen one another. Women often had the, and I'll be real honest, I, I've learned this over the years in so many ways, so many times, but men, women often have discernment and they have wisdom to see what, what we as men may miss. They expose some of the blind spots in our thinking. Women can do that. Uh, and so we would be wise to listen to their opinion and, and help them to state their case. And it's very important that we, we incorporate that into our thinking and our decision making. But in the end, but in the end, because of this concept of headship, man has been given this responsibility to make the hard decision. It's really, a, it's really a difficult thing. Now, in most cases, I think men and women, they make decisions together and they're, and they're really united. But in those rare occasions where there's uh, maybe a difference of opinion, well, guess what? The man is the final arbiter on the situation at hand. He has to make that decision. And guess what? Depending on the decision he makes, he's going to be judged more severely. So the question I have for women in this relationship is can we trust our husbands, because I'm not a, a woman, <laughs> I don't know if you noticed that, but can we trust our husbands to make the right decision? You know, a lot of people, I don't know, he, he's kind of, I don't know if I can do that. That sounds pretty difficult, Chuck. Now, this is key. I want you to listen to this. Submission from a wife is really not trusting the husband. Submission from a wife is really an act of trusting God because God is the one who gave you your husband to you as a gift. Your husband was given to you from God. So you have to entrust yourself to God that the man that he gave you is going to be able to make good decisions. And guess what? If you, as a man, make the wrong decision, you're going to be judged not her. She's not going to have to hold, uh, carry the bag for that. So it's actually the one who is the head. It's, it's a very weighty responsibility. It's one that you should take seriously. It's not something that we should, uh, we should uh, enter into lightly. Because um, it, it's, it's the whole family depending on your decisions to make the right ones. Now I know that there are some who listen to all this, they do not like this arrangement. <laughs> but God has it explicitly written here. It's explicitly clear that the man is the head of the wife. The passage is not outdated. Paul is not a male chauvinist pig. This is the inspired word of God, so we can't simply ignore it or declare that this is wrong. It's just cultural, something like that. I know when some women read this, they actually get really emotionally charged. And I believe it's because, again, it goes back to this fundamental misunderstanding of the passage. They think it teaches that maybe the woman has to be subservient, uh, this inferior slave, and she has to grovel at the feet of her husband, which we already said is not what this means at all. That's not what this principle teaches. It just talks about men and women having different responsibilities in a relationship. So how, how do we see women? I mean, I, I think this is one of the things about the Bible. The Bible actually elevates women to a great place of honor and importance. But just because we see this one issue of relationships in a marriage, of, of headship and submission, we somehow think that that's negated. Uh, there are two different views. I, perhaps you've heard about them, of the role of women in the world, the role of women in the church, and even the role of women in a family. Perhaps you've heard these terms. Maybe some of you aren't familiar, but one is the word egalitarian view, and the other is the complementarian view. The egalitarian view and the complementarian view. I don't want to get into a deep uh, uh, ex exhortation on this, but I suppose that depending on what camp you're in, it will invariably determine the view that you have of the role of men and women in, in marriage. So um, egalitarian kind of sounds interestingly like the word equal. Complementarian complements 
one another. So it's just a kind of a general way to, to look at this. But here's the undeniable reality. Regardless of, you know, all these theoretical academic discussions of the view of a woman and how she fits into society, there, are, there is this undeniable reality that men and women are different. <laughs> Wait, let that sink in. Men and women are different. It's newsflash. Guess what? They think differently. They look differently. It's obvious that they are physically distinct. Very different. And despite what the world is doing, the world is trying to make men and women the same, the two sexes are undeniably wired differently. So um, you can try to deny this, but I actually think this was exactly God's plan. This was the genius of God. He made men and women different so that each partner in this Christian marriage, this family, could bring something unique to the relationship. God made husbands and wives to complement one another, each with certain strengths and weaknesses. And I'll tell you, from personal experience, it's true. I imagine you can all guess which position I embrace. When a man and woman come together in the sacred covenant of marriage, they create this mutual partnership that becomes better together than apart. And that's because they complement one another. The man is given the responsibility, this heavy responsibility of being the leader. And most important, he needs to be the spiritual leader. And this woman is willing to follow and nurture and do all sorts of other things, which we're going to talk about her role next week. Uh, but he's also called to so many other things. The man has been given the responsibility to do this. And inherent with this position of headship comes the, the uh, responsibility of being a provider to the, to the home. You can look at that up in 1 Timothy. Uh, he's also called to be a servant and a lover. All these are, are responsibilities uh, that God has given to the man. If you look at later in, in uh, Ephesians 5, men are supposed to, are called to love their wives. Look at what it says here. Uh, this isn't in your notes, but it says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Can you imagine just this, um, this sacrificial, agape love, willing to give your life for your wife? That's what he's saying there. And a little farther down in verse 28, he says, Husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. This is this call to, to love. Um, if men actually love their wives like Christ loved the church, I am very confident that any wife would be glad to follow their husband. Who wouldn't want to follow someone that would die for you, that would give his life for you, that would serve you, that would be selfless? So um, that's really the thought. You know, I think of a passage in Philippians talking about Christ. This is how Christ was, right? It says, how did Christ love? Christ emptied himself, it says, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Can you imagine the God of the universe stooping down to become a servant, a bondservant to humanity? This is the humanity that shook their fist at him, the humanity that rebelled and sinned against him, a humanity that ignored his, his uh, plans and his purposes. And yet, because of his great love, he gave it all. He gave it all. So... If men would do that, I guarantee it wouldn't be very difficult for a woman to want to follow a man like that. That woman would follow you into a war. She would be your teammate. She would be right there by your side because she believes that you have her best interest in mind. So the only real issue is when we talk about these, 
these um, patterns that God has set up, these models that God has given to us, the only real is, issue is, will we follow God's design? Can we trust him? Is God really so out of touch with modern culture that we think that he doesn't know what he's talking about? I mean, think about it. This is, this is a wonderful pattern that he has laid out. And if we all really did what we were supposed to do, we could see a wonderful, abundant, fulfilling family and a relationship as a husband and wife. Now, you might be thinking, I know some of you are thinking, what if a leader in a home won't lead or isn't around to lead, right? Well, that is a problem because the truth is that no one can replace the father. Now, you wives, you women, you can do a great job of trying to make up for the void that has been created by being married to a non-existent father or husband or, you know, just an absentee kind of guy. But the reality is there is no way for a single parent to provide all that is needed for the children in that home. I know that you're thinking, well, I've seen a lot of women that have done that. Yeah, but there's just no way to fully replace the role of a male. God designed homes to have two partners, each playing different roles in order to provide this full perspective to the children, to provide the necessary resources for a healthy family. And like I said, next week we're going to talk about how the wife can fulfill uh, her God-given role in the family. Uh, but I need to be clear, this, this is in no way a knock against the heroic efforts of single parents out there. There are legions of single parents that have had to go this alone. But it wasn't God's way. They sacrificed. Their commitment to their children should be celebrated. But God had something better. God wired men and women differently. And he did it intentionally so that they would complement one another and they would give all of the necessary resources to that family. You know what? I'll just close with this. I could not provide for my daughters and my sons what their mother could. And their mother could not provide what I had to offer to my sons and daughters. God created men and women to work in tandem. This dynamic duo, a true team effort. And when that happens, it's going to have wonderful results. You're going to raise godly children. And that's the goal, isn't it? That, at the end of the day, isn't that the goal? That your kids grow up to fall in love with a Savior. So as we close, just think about this great heavy role of responsibility that we have to be part of the solution in a family. Each of us has a different role to play, and we need to know our roles. We need to fill, fulfill those roles. And, uh, you know, I think of God as I close. This guy is going to come up. And, uh, but, you know, God demonstrates for us how we should live as men. You men that I've been talking to, I've been I've been really hammering how important it is for you to step up. Well, that's what God did. God stepped up. God, God does um, the unpopular. God does the thankless job. God did the unthinkable thing by coming down to this earth to be our Savior, to die on a cross, to pay for the sins of the world. Greater love has no man than this than a man lay down his life for a friend. And he laid down his life for this whole world. So we can at least lay down our lives for our wives. But what a great example we have. And just think that now God, because of his great love for us, has made a way for us to have a relationship with him. He's made a way for us to enjoy eternity. And all we have to do is put our faith and trust in what Jesus did for us. And we will experience the blessings of one day being part of his family in heaven for all eternity. Isn't that great? I just think that uh, if we could only live like Christ, 
uh, we would see our families turn around. It would be a great thing. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for um, this interesting topic. And uh, it's not talked about a lot, but we really have to just keep reminding ourselves that this is your design. You've called men to a heavy calling, to a high calling, and you've called us to step it up, to step up to the, um, to the plate and uh, to really show up. And I pray, Lord, that as men listening today, that we would take this role seriously and soberly and live the way that you uh, asked us to, that uh, you've designed us to be. I pray, Lord, that we're trusting you to make us the men and the fathers and the husbands that you designed us to be in the home. And I pray for that in Christ's name. Amen.